Hello and welcome to the interview here on France 24. Our guest today is the U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. You're on a trip uh, to Paris and then on to London and uh, Brussels uh, to discuss a number of issues, but especially uh, the issues of sanctions against uh, Russia. Many people in the U.S. and in Europe are asking, are they actually working or are they benefiting Vladimir Putin more than they're hurting him? So the sanctions are working, and that's why Russia is working so hard to evade them. You look at what's happening on the battlefield, for example. Russia's military-industrialized complex is reliant on supplies from our countries in order to build things like precision missiles, to build their tanks. And because of the actions countries like France have taken and the United States have taken, Russia no longer has access to things like semiconductors that are critical to the missiles that they are trying to use in Ukraine, so they're unable to build more of them. They no longer have access to heavy materials, which are critical to building their tanks and other things that they're using on the battlefield. They can't rebuild because of the actions that we've taken to date. And in addition to going after the supply chain for their military industrialized complex, we've also gone after Russia's revenues, which means they have less money to prop up their economy, but also to fight their unjustifiable war in Ukraine. Right. Uh, but what they still have is obviously revenues, uh, revenues sorry, from oil and gas. And uh, so uh, this is obviously one of the issues I imagine you're discussing with your partners is a cap on the price of Russian oil. Uh, there is discussion that this will be implemented on December uh, 5th. So can you tell us if, yes, this will happen and how this will happen? Yes, it will happen. And it's important to remember where this, where this started. In the summer, Europe made the decision to stop the purchase of Russian oil by December 5th. In addition to deciding not to purchase Russian oil, uh, the European Council decided that they were going to ban the use of European services for the transportation of Russian oil. In conversations amongst the G7, we decided that we were going to institute an oil price cap, which would mean that Russia would be able to use European, American, Western services to transport their oil as long as the oil was sold below a certain point, um, introducing a price cap. And the reality is that since the United States and Europe will no longer buy Russian oil as of December 5th, this oil will now be available to developing and emerging market economies, hopefully at a far lower price, which will mean that countries in Africa and Latin America who have been hurt by the increased price of oil due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine will now have the ability to buy this oil that Europe used to buy, hopefully at a decreased price. Ultimately, we have two goals. One is to make sure that Russian oil continues to flow in order to make sure that global energy markets remain stable. But the second one is to deny Russia the revenues that they have earned because of their unjustifiable war in Ukraine. But uh, obviously, uh, the devil is always in the details. Uh, first of all, will the December uh, 5 deadline be respected? And then will it be a fixed price or a moving target? I mean, and at what price if there is one? So December 5th is the date that Europe has picked to put in place their sixth sanctions package, which will mean that as of December 5th, countries like France will no longer purchase Russian oil. So that date is set in stone by European law. Uh, we've worked closely with the fr French government and governments throughout Europe and across the G7 to implement the price cap, which will come into effect on that date as well and will be seen as an exception to the European services ban, which will allow Western services to be used to ship Russian oil as long as it's sold below the price cap. The, where the price will be set, we've been very clear that we're going to set a price. There will not be a floating price for Russian oil. So a fixed oil. price. It'll be a fixed price. And what we've said clearly is that we're going to set that price well above the price of production for, for Russia because we want to create incentives in which Russian oil continues to flow, but we want to also deny Russia the revenues, the revenues that they have earned because of the war that they've declared in Ukraine. Part of the goal here is because we all recognize that emerging market economies and developing economies in places like Africa have been particularly hit by Russia's war in Ukraine. So we know that the oil that Europe will no longer buy on December 5th will hopefully now be offered to those countries at a discount, which will allow them to be able to use Western services to ship that oil. But that's the theory, because, I mean, let's say China and India. Uh, the two elephants in the room, if I may use the expression, will they abide by this oil cap or will they decide, well, this is America's business, Europe's business, this is not our business, we continue to buy Russian oil at market price? 
So ultimately, the reason that the price cap works is because it's in the economic interest of even large purchasers like Russia, like China and India, who, like every other country, wants to pay as little as possible for any of the energy that they purchase. Ultimately, these countries may make the decision to buy that energy outside of the price cap coalition. Russia can continue to sell out oil outside the price cap coalition. But what we know about that is that if Russia is selling oil to a country without using Western services, those services are going to be more expensive. And the countries that they're negotiating with will know what the price is that the price cap coalition has set, and they'll negotiate a lower price with Russia, which will mean that our two objectives are being met. One, Russian oil will continue to flow onto the market, but Russia will reduce the revenues that they're earning selling it going forward. So you don't believe Russia's claim that uh, it will not sell oil if such a price cap is enforced? You, don't, you, you believe they're just bluffing? What Russia has said is that they will not sell oil to countries that participate in the price cap. But we've decided we're not going to buy Russian oil any longer. The United States is no longer buying Russian oil. Europe has made the determination that they will no longer buy Russian oil. Russia continues today to sell oil to countries around the world, and we know that Russian oil is being sold at a discount because they have fewer buyers today than they had before their unjustifiable uh, invasion of Ukraine. Our goal is to reduce their revenues even further and to widen the spread between Russian Urals and Brent. And the hope is that that oil will go to developing economies who need it most. Russia's biggest customers are countries like Ru China and India. And I know they have an interest in continuing to see Russian oil flow and in paying as little as possible for that as well. Right. More broadly on the issue of sanctions, some countries are not enforcing them clearly. Uh, let's take an example. I, I believe you were there not that long ago. Turkey, a NATO member uh, what do you do with those countries? Do you, do you sanction them for not enforcing the sanctions? Do you talk to them saying, you know, we need our help? Because basically, especially in the case of Turkey, it seems they're benefiting from this more than anything else. So what we know is that Russia is attempting to evade our sanctions because they're having such an, effect, an impact on their ability to get the materials they need to fight their unjustified war in Ukraine and also to grow their economy, an economy that's shrinking at the moment. What I'll say more broadly is that we've made very clear across the G7 that we will go after companies, individuals, and countries that help Russia evade their sanctions. We've, of course, had conversations with countries around the world um, including countries um, like Turkey, about the importance of them what do they tell you? enforcing our sanctions. And what you've seen in Turkey, for example, is that recently Turkey made the decision to cut off their banks from the Mir network because they were concerned about the risk that created for their financial institutions of um, Russia evasion. And I think what each country is doing is they're taking actions to try and prevent evasion because it's in their economic interest. Ultimately, for a country like Turkey or for any other country, they know that their relationship with the countries in our coalition, which represent more than 50% of the global economy, is more important than their relationship with Russia, which represents, which has an economy that at its height was $1.7 trillion and is getting smaller each day because of the actions we're taking with our sanctions. Right. Uh, I want to touch briefly upon the issue of uh, inflation fears uh, in the U.S. Uh, everywhere. I mean, obviously, this is a major uh, issue, uh, not only for the midterm elections in, in the U.S., but in many other uh, countries. Are you still concerned about the level of inflation we're seeing? So you're right that inflation is a global concern. Um, we're facing inflation, high rates of inflation in the United States, but you're also facing them here in Europe. And it's important for us to realize what's causing that. We're all dealing with two shocks that have happened to the global economy over the last several years, one being COVID-19 and the second one being Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ultimately, we're taking steps in the United States to bring down inflation, and a big step towards that direction was the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which puts us on a path to reduce our deficits aligned with the work that our Federal Reserve is doing. In the United States, our central bank has the primary role for fighting inflation, and the president has made clear that he's going to respect their independence. But we're also going to take actions at our level in the executive branch to do things to reduce inflation. For example, we released a historic amount of strategic petroleum reserve from the United States in order to bring down the cost of gas. And we've seen gas prices in the United States come down by up to $1.20. We've also 
pass laws that have helped to control the price of medicine that has been a huge driver of high costs in the United States as well. And we're committed to doing much more in the United States, but doing so in coordination and collaboration with our allies like the government here in France. Well, speaking of that, uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction uh, Act. Uh, 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 today, uh, this uh, Monday, the French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire uh, went on a tear saying uh, this was a major problem for us. He said it was not acceptable. It would create a major shock on European industry, and uh, France and Europe uh, should not accept this. What do you do to answer those concerns? So I'm happy I'm here in France today because it gives me an opportunity to meet with the French government and talk to them about the benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act and the climate They're not talking provisions. about benefits. They're talking about the danger of the threat. I think part of that is because we haven't had a chance to explain to them why we think that this actually creates benefits for the French government, but for governments around the world, because we have two shared goals. One is reducing the impact of climate change on our economies, and the Inflation Reduction Act does that not only for the United States, but for the globe. And the second one is creating a clean energy economy. And while the Inflation Reduction Act will create clear benefits for the U.S. economy, we think it will actually create benefits for the global economy, including so the it's French a misunderstanding. Economy. I think that mu much of this has to do with how the bill and the legislation will be implemented, and we're still working through implementation in the United States. The European Union provided a set of comments to us that we had requested about how we can do that implementation in a way that will create economic opportunities, not just in the United States, but here in Europe, which is ultimately our goal, to try and build a clean energy economy that will help us meet two goals that we share. One is reducing the impact of climate change, and the second one is growing a clean energy economy, not just in the United States, but around the world. Thank you very much, uh, Will Wally uh, at the YEMO for uh, coming on the France 24 uh, set. Thank you very much for watching this interview. Stay tuned for more news. Thanks for having me.